Regular viewers of the channel will be very familiar with my love for Project Gutenberg and their fantastic library of out of copyright ebooks. In particular, I love finding old travel novels, old travel journals of people who had the privilege to explore the world before tourism and globalization were really things. Recently, I did find a couple of books that considering their context and the contents, I was pretty shocked that I hadn't heard of earlier. I'm fairly confident you haven't either. So today on Out of the Page, I would love to tell you the story of a frankly kind of ridiculous person, the Austrian explorer, Ida Pfeiffer. Ida was born in Vienna in 1797 to a wealthy family and for the next 44 years lived the most normal life imaginable. Despite having a reputation for boldness in her youth, she married in her early 20s, had children whom she loved and raised, and her life didn't change too much until the boys became adults with careers of their own. She was then middle-aged, lived apart from her husband, and had a burning desire to see the world. From childhood, Ida had a profound fascination with traveling. As she read Robinson Crusoe furiously, she was a huge fan of the explorer Alexander von Humboldt, and she idolized the explorers of her day without having any real hope of ever becoming one of them. It's hard to conceptualize it now, but in her day and age, tourism was not really a thing at all. Most people didn't leave their country in their entire lifetime, and those that did were wealthy, well-connected, and almost always male. Depending on where they traveled to as well, most didn't go abroad without having local guides to keep them safe along the way. And none of that extinguished Edith's desire to travel, which burned away until finally in 1842, and in the midst of a plague, she finally set off to see the world at the age of 45. Before setting off on her first trip, Ida decided to keep a diary of her travels, and it is those diaries that we are left with today. Despite her trips being a fairly absurd undertaking for a solo female traveller of her age and in her age, she had no desire to share the diaries beyond family and friends, and it wasn't until word of mouth and a bit of gentle nudging that they found their way to a publisher. And I'll let their words from the preface to her first book set the scene for us. Few men were found to possess the degree of strength and endurance requisite for carrying out such an undertaking, but that a delicate lady of the higher classes, a native of Vienna, should have the heroism to do what thousands of men failed to achieve seemed almost incredible. He wasn't exaggerating either. Uh, Ida writes about the reactions her family and friends had when she told them about the journey she was planning to take. And they obviously tried to get her to reconsider and tell her about all the awful hardships and trials that she'd be put through. She even wrote, I made my will and arranged all my worldly affairs in such a manner that, in the case of my death, an event which I considered more probable than my safe return, my family should find everything perfectly arranged. So for her first journey, she travelled down the Danube to modern day Turkey and then to the Holy Land, modern day Israel, through Egypt and Italy. Those are all pretty familiar names to a modern traveler, but to illustrate how different things were in her time, whilst moving between towns in the Holy Land, they could only travel during daylight hours as there were so many bandits in the hills that travel after dark was simply too dangerous. Whilst in Constantinople, she visited, and this bit was pretty confronting to read, slave markets. For the most part, the world she set out into is not the world we know today. With that in mind though, at one point when she and a group of other travellers were trying to reach Jerusalem, they decided to set out at midnight because they figured that no one would suspect tourists would do something so stupid and dangerous. It goes without saying too that all the people she rode with in her journeys were strangers she met along the way, and that she was the only female traveller amongst them. When she returned to Europe, as I mentioned, her diaries eventually found their way to a publisher and were published under the title A Vienna Woman's Trip to the Holy Land. Despite being written about 170 years ago, the book is actually still pretty readable from a modern standpoint and is very enjoyable and descriptive. It also includes illustrations of some of the sites she saw, which gives a good illustration of what they look like at the time and how different they are to the world we know. Not long afterwards, in 1845, she traveled to Scandinavia, all the way north as far as Iceland, and prepared herself by studying Danish, English, and learning how to properly preserve plant and animal specimens. Her journals were published for this trip as well, 
and with the income she earned from the two books, she set off on an outrageous journey even by modern standards. The next year, in 1846, Ida travelled, and I'm not exaggerating about this, around the world. And what I mean by that is that she took a steamer straight across the Atlantic to Brazil, from where she travelled upriver into the deep rainforest with a single travelling companion and servant. Then she sailed to Tahiti, then China, then Singapore, which was only then in the process of being established as a modernised country. From there, she travelled through India, overland through modern-day Iraq, to Georgia, through the Russian Federation, back into Europe. She spent the trip learning local customs and cultures, visiting temples and ruins, collecting specimens, which we'll come back to, and documenting parts of the world which the average European would barely have even known about. She was gone for more than two years, and her diaries were published as A Woman's Journey Around the World. And as has become tradition, they became bestsellers as well. And another point is that despite being a novice at collecting specimens, she was so good at it that the ones she collected on this trip eventually made their way to the Royal Museum of Vienna. Nor was she done yet. Despite at this point being in her mid-50s, Ida's next trip was if you can believe it, even more ambitious. In 1851, she left for another trip around the world, this time to places even less visited by Europeans. Before she set sail though, she had somewhat of a watershed moment when she made her first stop, Berlin, where she was greeted and celebrated by other noteworthy explorers, including her childhood idol, Alexander von Humboldt. She first sailed to Cape Town, South Africa, then to the Malay Archipelago. She spent the next year and a half exploring the islands of modern-day Indonesia and Borneo, and although she was strongly warned against it, she made a point of meeting head-hunting tribes and those that practiced cannibalism. She even joked with them that she was too old and tough to make a good meal. She also wrote about what great hosts they were, their legal practices, and the kind of dishes they would make people out of. From there, she crossed the Pacific, landed in North America, then journeyed south to Ecuador and Peru, then back up into the US before finally heading home to Vienna after four years abroad. Obviously, another fantastic travelogue followed, this time titled My Second Trip Around the World. And it wasn't until after that, at the age of 60, that Ida set out for what would be her final journey. This time, she set sail for the island of Madagascar, where she fell in with a group of Europeans who, unbeknownst to her, were actually involved in an attempt to overthrow the island's ruler. The plot was discovered, and Ida was expelled from the country along with the group, but not before being marched through disease-ridden swamps where she caught malaria. She made it back to Vienna, but never fully recovered from the infection, and died in October 1858 at the age of 61. Of course, she managed to keep her travel journals, and these were her final posthumous publications. By the time of her death, she had become a member of the Geographical Societies of Berlin and Paris, and in the years that passed, she became the first woman whose remains were interned in the Rose of Honor dead in the Central Cemetery in Vienna. I don't think it's particularly original to say that ordinary people don't achieve extraordinary things, but I think it's equally fair to say that Ida Pfeiffer was not an ordinary person. She can't have been, not, not to do what she did. The scale of what she undertook in her life I don't think properly translates to our current view of the world, but maybe these numbers will. In a day before air travel, before even train travel was widely used, she managed to cover 32,000 kilometres by land and a quarter of a million kilometres by sea. And if that isn't extraordinary, I don't know what is. Like I said at the start, I found her works through Project Gutenberg, so I can assure you they are there waiting to be read if you are interested. And they are interesting from a number of perspectives, and the main one, at least, that I found at the start is just to see how different the world was in our day and age compared to hers, which in the scale of human history isn't actually that long ago, but hell of a lot has changed and she's a really good guide to what it used to be. You might be lucky and find them in print somewhere, I'm not going to guarantee that because I'm pretty sure they're not available widely and they're certainly not actively being printed as far as I'm aware. I would hope though that somebody like Ida with a life like she led might deserve republication, but you know, that's outside of my hands and I'm just here to tell you that she existed at all. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have actually read her works before, please let me know in the comments. I'm really interested to see what other people's thoughts are. I will be back soon. Thank you for watching. I'm almost a, a thousand subscribers. That sounds like a paltry number compared to other channels, but to me that is absurd. So thank you if you are subscribed to the channel. Um, and if you're not, 
you can consider it. I don't upload that frequently, but I do upload. I am consistent in that respect. So thank you for watching. Have a good week or weeks and I will see you later.